This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. I sometimes think back on the night I met Jeremy, and I wonder, had we not made eye contact, would my life still end the same? Was it my destiny from the beginning to suffer such a tragic end? Or is my tragic end a result of poor choices rather than fate? Of course, I haven't met a tragic end yet, or I wouldn't be able to recount what led to it. Nevertheless, it's coming. I can sense it, just as I sensed Chaston's death, and just as I embraced her fate, I will embrace my own. I wouldn't say I was lost before the night I met Jeremy, but I had certainly never been found until the moment he laid eyes on me from across the room. I'd had boyfriends before, one night stands even, but I'd never come close to imagining life with someone else until that moment. When I saw him, I pictured our first night together, our wedding, our honeymoon, our children. Until that moment, the idea of love had always felt very manufactured to me, a hallmark ploy, a marketing scheme for greeting card companies. I had no interest in love. My only goal that night was to get drunk on free booze and find a rich investor to fuck. I was already halfway there having downed three Moscow mules. And judging by the look of Jeremy Crawford, I was going to leave that party an overachiever. He looked rich, and it was a charity event after all. Poor people don't show up to charity events unless they're serving the rich, present company not included. He was talking with a few other men, but every time he'd glance in my direction, I felt like we were the only two people in the room. Every now and then, he would smile at me. Of course he did. I had on my red dress that night, the one I stole from Macy's. Don't judge me. I was a starving artist, and it was ridiculously expensive. I intended to make up for the theft when I had the money. I donate to a charity or save a baby or something. The good thing about sins is they don't have to be atoned for immediately and that red dress was too perfect for me to pass up. It was a fuckable dress, the kind of dress a man can easily bypass when he wants between your legs. The mistake women make when they choose their clothes for events like the one I was at is that they don't think about them from the man's perspective. A woman wants her breasts to look good, her figure to be hugged, even if that means sacrificing comfort and wearing something impossible to remove. But when men look at dresses, they aren't admiring the way it hugs the hips, or the cinch at the waist, or the fancy tie up the back. They're sizing up how easy it will be to remove. Will he be able to slip his hand up her thigh when they're seated next to each other at a table? Will he be able to fuck her in a car without the awkward mess of zippers and spanks? Will he be able to fuck her in the bathroom without having to remove her clothes completely? The answers to my stolen red dress were yes, yes, and hell yes. I realized with that dress on, there was no way he would be able to leave the party without approaching me. I chose to stop paying attention to him. It made me seem desperate. I was not the mouse. I was the cheese. I was going to stand there until he came to me. He did, eventually. I was standing at the bar, my back to him, when he put his hand on my shoulder and leaned forward, motioning for the bartender. Jeremy didn't look at me in that moment. He simply kept his hand on my shoulder, as if he were laying claim to me. When the bartender approached, I watched in fascination. Jeremy nudged his head toward me and said, Make sure you only serve her water for the rest of the evening. I hadn't been expecting that. I turned, leaning an arm on the bar, and faced him. He dropped his hand from my shoulder, but not before his fingers grazed all the way down to my elbow. A flicker of electricity flashed through me, mixed with a surge of anger 